Today on the show, we're going to be talking about Gaia, the main world in Final Fantasy IX. If you didn't know that the planet is only 6,000 years old, then this video is for you. Now, Final Fantasy IX is my favourite game in the main Final Fantasy series. There's just so much going on and people always miss so much of it. Now, I bet some of you are going, but Faust, if the planet is only 6,000 years old, how does it have its own industrial revolution? Well, I don't really want to get into that today. Like, it deserves its own freaking video. But what I will say is that you need to keep in mind that the species on this planet, unlike our planet, they don't have a common ancestor in the evolutionary chain. So it's fair to assume that their brains work in so many different ways that if two different species teamed up, they could accomplish so much more than if just humans teamed up. Now, roughly 6,000 years before the game begins, the planet of Gaia is born. We don't know how, but what we do know is civilizations quickly form on the planet's surface, and the nearby planet of Terra quickly takes notice of Gaia. Not of the civilizations, but of the size of the planet. Roughly 1,000 years pass, and Terra's planet crystal is in a critical condition. So the people of Terra have the idea that they are going to merge Terra with Gaia because of the speed that Gaia is evolving at. It must have a really, really healthy, thriving planet crystal. So, they attempted to merge the two planets, and they were right. Gaia did have a very strong crystal. In fact, it was too strong. You see, when they started the merge, so much went wrong, and the surface of Gaia was left in total ruins, and all civilization was wiped out. As for the planet of Terra, it was warped inside of Gaia, which gives you a rough idea of just how huge Gaia is. A few locations from Terra actually did make it onto the surface of Gaia. These locations include Ibsen's Castle, Oliver, and I believe Desert Palace? Also, the entire Forgotten Continent. I believe that is actually a continent from Terra. A good way while playing the game to tell if a location is from Terra or Gaia is if that location has a blue crystal chest instead of a wooden chest, then that place is from Terra. And I think that is very interesting. Shimmering Island was created as a gateway between the two worlds, but we don't know if it was created as a side effect of the failed fusion, or if the surviving Terrians decided we need a gateway between these planets and made Shimmering Island. But I like that we don't know, because it leaves some mystery to the world. The Terrians, seeing how bad of a job they did, decided that they were going to seal their souls inside of Pandemonium, and leave Garland, an uh, android that they created to ensure Terra survival, in charge of fixing everything that they broke, essentially. And Garland honestly lives to do nothing else other than this, and he goes to all amounts of extremes. Garland puts the magical Ifa tree from Terra up onto Gaia, but something he didn't expect is that because of the size of Gaia, the Ifa tree can actually flourish a lot more than on Terra, and it grows right from the center of the planet up to the surface, and its roots cover the entire planet. Like, even the part of the tree that you enter through on disc two, I believe, that is roots all intertwined together. So skip forward 3,000 years, and Garland has created genomes. Now these genomes are these vessels for the Terrian souls to go into once the planet merge has been completed. They literally do nothing other than eat, sleep, and, well, function. They don't feel emotion, they don't know how to have fun, they just are. Garland came up with the idea to sync the Terra crystal soul cycle with the Gaia crystal soul cycle. Now, the soul cycle is essentially when a soul dies, it goes back to the planet crystal, and would eventually be redispersed out to the planet into another body. Essentially, a natural form of reincarnation. This would have been a really, really good idea, because 
If the two were in sync with each other, they would have just merged because of how close they were. But because Gaia was a new planet, it had thousands and millions of souls at its disposal, but Terra only had a few. It was a dying planet. And this meant that Gaia's crystal would have easily overpowered Terra's crystal. Garland altered the Eifer tree, so it made it impossible for Gaian souls to return to their crystal. However, there was still the issue of Terra's crystal not having any souls available. Skip forward once again to about 1,800 years before the game begins, and civilization has started to flourish once again on Gaia's surface, and the shimmering island glows bright, and this marks the beginning of modern civilization. It's super effective! Now skip forward another 1,000 years, and Garland places the soul cage at the base of the Eifer tree, causing Gaian souls that are in the crystal to be slowly replaced with Terrian souls thus causing the Terrian Crystal to slowly overpower the Gaian Crystal. And it looked like it was working, because flora and fauna from Terra were slowly starting to flourish on the surface of Gaia. So where did all the Gaian souls go? Well, they were dispersed through the Aifa tree's roots as mist, and then dispersed out into the atmosphere, and then that's where they would join and create monsters, but this forced civilization to seek higher ground, but it also meant travel became kind of rare and difficult. This lack of travel and communication bred ignorance for other cultures, and civilizations just began warring against one another. This ignorance creating war just created death, which just caused more monsters to form, which just caused more death, and it stopped every soul from returning to Gaia's soul crystal, thus causing Terra's crystal to continue to overpower the Gaian crystal. This was obviously all part of Garland's plan. Eventually, airships were created, making travel between cities much easier, thus breeding a time of understanding one another, and thus eradicating any need for war, and thus the amount of souls returned to a regular amount. So now we're at the year 1300, just 500 years before the game starts. The Eidolon Alexander is summoned for the first time, and he is too powerful for the summoners to control. He's extracted from the summoner who summoned him, and his gemstone is split into four pieces. And these four pieces were given to the main three nations on the Mist Continent, and also the summoners kept one and left the Mist Continent to go to the place where the pulse of the world centers. Idolans were never totally forgotten, but their form kind of relies on people remembering them. So take Shiva, for example, when she was first summoned, she was like a young girl kind of pixie. And then, obviously in the game, she's like this bitch-ass goddess. And it's even theorised that Ozma is the form of an Eidolon that's been forgotten. Back on the Mist Continent, Amicia has broken out in civil war over who should get control of the crystal. Eventually, a group of fundamentalists move to the nearby Vub Desert and create their own nation of Clara, and they keep the crystal. Clara wouldn't isolate itself totally until the year 1389. This was also the same year that Sid Fabul I became the regent of Lindblom after winning the Festival of the Hunt. Skip forward to the year 1776, and we have a number of our party members and plot characters born by this point. Also, huge strides have been made in the medical field, and life expectancy is now much longer than it was 300 years ago. With the death rate of people being at an all-time low, Garland was a bit grumpy. And by grumpy, I mean murderously frustrated. Garland creates a genome that has a soul, and he tells this genome, you have to go to Gaia and get people to start killing each other. And obviously, this genome is Kuja. Garland actually sees Kuja as a total failure, though. And it's nothing personal, it's just that Kuja is unable to feel complex human emotions, which makes him unable to go into trance, which kind of makes him a bit weak. Garland still has Kuja working away on Gaia, but he also puts a limit on Kuja's life, and he spends about 10 years trying to figure out what the hell to do next. In this 10 years, Garland realises for a genome to be able to enter trance, 
it has to grow up from the age of a child, so it's learnt to feel emotions. Skip forward to the end of the ten years, and we have the creation of Zidane. So when he creates Zidane, he creates him with the body of a child, so he can grow naturally. As naturally as a created body can grow, at least. Kuja learns about Zidane's creation, and also finds out that over time, Zidane will become much more powerful than Kuja. Kuja is instantly jealous, and he begins to plot the end of Zidane. Also in the same year, Sid Fabul IX begins to create an airship that is not mist-powered. Skip forward another four years, and Kuja kidnaps Zidane and puts him somewhere on Gaia. Kuja makes his home in the Desert Palace, and Zidane makes his home with the Tantalus Theatre Group in Lindblom. Now we're at the year 1790, ten years before the start of the game. Garland can finally see the end of his plan in sight. The Gaian Crystal has been deprived of souls for so long, it's become very, very weak, and the Terrian Crystal can finally almost merge with it. It was at this time that Garland just... broke. You see, Terra's Crystal had always been kind of small, so it had never really been powerful enough to create Eidolons of its own, but Gaia's Crystal obviously created Alexander 500 years ago, and Garland saw what that Eidolon could do, and he was like, right, I need to put an end to this right now. Garland searched all over Gaia, and he eventually found the summoners in Madame Sari. He says to Kuja, destroy this village. But Kuja, at first, gets a little bit curious about what was scaring Garland so much, and if he could utilize the power of Eidolons. So while Madame Sari is being destroyed, a woman and her daughter Sarah sail away on a boat. Now, the woman dies at sea, but the daughter manages to stay alive, and she eventually drifts into Alexandria Castle Dock. And the people there are amazed at just how much she looks like the recently deceased Princess Garnet. Sarah's summoner horn is removed from her head, and she becomes the new Princess Garnet. A few people do manage to survive at Madame Sari, but before it was like a thriving city, and now it's just this tiny little tribe of about ten people, maybe more, probably less. So sometime between 1796 and 1799, Kuja begins to meet with Queen Bran. Now, he begins to fill Queen Bran's head up with all these ideas, and eventually she is consumed with greed, and she wants to utilize the power of Eidolons for herself. But not just any Eidolons, she wants to conquer the nearby nations and go to the outer continent to get the crystal fragments together and summon Alexander. Kuja continues to manipulate Bram, and even shows her how to create black mages. He creates a prototype one, and shows her how to mass-produce one, and the nearby village of Dali is chosen to be the place where all the black mages would be created. It's super effective! Finally, we're at the year 1799, one year before the beginning of the game. Garland becomes aware that the gears of his plan are turning much faster now, and he creates Nikoto. He creates her because he realizes that Zidane will be returning to Terra very soon, and he wants another genome with a soul to be there to greet him. Simultaneously, the completion of an airship that doesn't need mist is created, the Hilda Grade 1. Also, Sid's wife, Hilda, finds out that he has been cheating on her. So she commandeers the Hildegrade One, not before though turning Sid into an obglob. Unable to create another airship with an obglob brain, he is left stranded and not able to chase his wife. Obviously, the fact that the ruler of Lindenblum was now an obglob was kept secret from the general public. Later, Hilda runs into Kuja, and he commandeers the airship off of her, and then takes Hilda as hostage. While she's hostage, he begins to brag about all his plans to her. A few months later, Ambini, the prototype black mage, is created. He falls out of the cargo ship while flying somewhere over Treno. He is fished out of the sky by a Q named Quam, 
and Quan has the intention to eat Bibi at first. The two quickly develop a grandfather-grandson relationship, and this is said to be mostly due to the fact that Quan noticed Vivi wasn't going to grow, so there wouldn't be much point in eating him. January 1st of 1800 comes about, and Quan dies. Simultaneously, Vivi wins a ticket to see a play in Alexandria. He travels to Alexandria, and thus begins the events of Final Fantasy IX. During the events of Final Fantasy IX, Terror will be destroyed, the Ivory Tree will be destroyed, your fields will be destroyed, your fields will be restored, the cohabitation of genomes and black mages would happen, and you will end the game feeling good about yourself. Mostly. All of the events in the main game happen between January 15th to March 16th. I would go into details of those here, but that would require its own video once again. It's super Okay guys, that is it for today. If you think I've missed anything about Final Fantasy IX, please let me know in the comments down below. Also, if there's a video game or comic book that you'd like me to cover, please also let me know in the comments down below. Don't forget to thumbs up this video and subscribe. My name is Faust, this has been Exploring Video Games, and it is super effective.